So let's move on to this uh, unique world of IR thermometry and some of the things that get you, you get to uh, experience there. So we're going to talk a little bit about some of the theory of how it works, just to, to give you a basis. Again, this is a temperature is so broad and it touches so many industries that it's, uh, it's, it's hard to cover everything in depth. But let's spend a little bit of time doing that. The infrared energy that is, is emitted uh, is below basically visible light. So a wavelength of visible light is right around um, half a micron or 500 nanometers. Uh, the uh, infrared energy is below that, so it's below the visible spectrum. And it's, it's based on the principle that every form of matter with, with temperature above absolute zero emits infrared radiation relative to the, uh, to the temperature. Anybody here read anything about astronomy or you know cosmology or does anybody care about those topics? So you ever heard of the term the heat death of the universe where it all well this is what causes that. So eventually all this infrared radiation radiates back down to the background level of the universe and everything dies. So this is this, this, that's what you're measuring. So you know if you want to make infrared a little more sexy, it's the, you're measuring the heat death of the universe uh, in here. So so long. Ago. Maybe it makes something useful out of that. Um, and this is where it, it, it fits in the, in the spectrum. So, you know, visible light's right about here, and uh, infrared's right in this area. So above terahertz and below visible light. For the, for the vast majority of the infrared guns that you're going to comp, um, are going to um, you calibrate, you're going to see these, they're in the 8 to 14 micron range. So that's uh, about 15 to 30 times longer wavelength than visible light. And that's because there's this, this in the, I should say sweet spot, maybe it's not the, the best term, but in the, in the, in the response of the, uh, the atmosphere, uh, or excuse me, the response of the, the sensors, water vapor will absorb um, some of the infrared energy at certain wavelengths, but in eight to fourteen, it's it's uh, it's fairly consistent. It's minimal and it's consistent. So that's where these like to look because no matter where you're using infrared gun, there's probably some humidity in the in the room. So rather than that helps eliminate that variability. But there are also cases when you're doing things like uh, you know uh, power plants or you're 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 watching a combustion process. Or other, or, or a, a, uh, like a turbine generator or something, where you've got a lot of carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide. Well, those absorb in the eight to fourteen micron range. So if you have a lot of that in the area, now you want to look at a different temperature. Your high temperature, you don't care about water vapor because now that's been burned out of the atmosphere. Now you're dealing with the interference of carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide, and that's one to three microns. So you really see those two, but those are. Th those are um, less common. You probably see those if you're doing servicing a steel mill or some kind of metallurgical um, process. Or again, some power plants use those. And this, uh, we need to define what the term emissivity is. And emissivity is a is a really a derived quantity, and it's basically a ratio of of the, the surfaces radiation compared to the ideal black body. So in, a, in an ideal black body, it emits um, you know, all of its infrared radiation that's detectable. That's a ratio of one. And then that ratio goes down to zero. When you're, when you're, if someone comes to you and says, oh, we want to use this new infrared gun, very often if you're working at Cal Lab, they'll say, um, what do you think of this new product we want to put in, a, in, in service? Something you want to look for is that it has the uh, the emissivity is settable, because if you can't set the emissivity, uh, you 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 again you don't know where a person is using it. They need to set that for the s the surface that they're dealing with. So here, let's look at the let's, uh, just a range of of, uh, of uh, different substances and what their emissivity is. So. Right at the top, you've got aluminum foil at 0 0.03. It basically, its emissivity is, is crap. So shiny things, in general, are terrible to measure with an infrared gun. And but then, as you get as the as the aluminum ages and it oxidizes and gets more of a 
a rough surface, it goes all the way up to 0 0.9. So, <laughs> you know, when you're measuring aluminum, it's almost a random number generator. <laughs> Uh, other things, other things to notice here. A lot of these numbers are between 0.9 and 1, so not bad. Uh, here's an interesting one down here. Water is is 0.96. Ice is 0.97. So that's that's actually pretty pretty useful. Um, so it's not that far off. But if you're something, if you're varying between 0.9 and 1, the that's obviously a 10% variation just in if you're going from surface to surface. So it's, it's important to be able to know what you're measuring and, uh, and be able to set that gun accordingly. Mm -hmm. um, that's actually, you know, that, that falls almost under the, the, uh, the area at the high level of, of a lot of National Metrology Institutes where they work and it's like how many you know, angels are on the head of a pin kind of stuff. It, it really is because it, the, so the way that, uh, you know, when, um, actually later on, I'll, I'll, I'll hit that a little bit more. Let me, let me save that for the, the later piece of it and how they get there. there there's also some uh, of a few guns that are, are used that are two color. And these basically operate from the one to three micron to the eight and 14. They actually have two sensors in them. And they're using a ratio metric technique because they can't, You've got a lot of in interference in terms of smoke and, uh, uh, and things that are in your, what you're trying to measure. So instead of saying, oh, well, let me you know, come up with the emissivity, you've got atmospheric absorption interference, they're, they're really using the two wavelengths and saying, well, how do they compare? So they're, they're, they're looking at the ratio between the two to come up with a, a measurement. So if you get those, you. The, the point of this is if you have one like this, you actually have to calibrate that with two different uh, mechanisms because you need two different emitters or something that you know the emission of wavelength from those two different points. So there, and an, an infrared gun, it, it has optics, although optics is a poor term because that really relates to the, uh, the idea of visible light. But there are substances that pass, silicon and germanium as an example, they pass infrared, although they're, they block uh, visible light. So, the, so you, they can't create a, a device that focuses the infrared radiation on an internal component that's sensing the level of, of this. But the field of view is an important piece. Um, so what you're looking at is something like, you know, if you have a 10 to one, field of view, that means, you know, it's whether it's, you know, one, one meter away is, you know, a tenth of a tenth of a meter in terms of spot size, um, you know, 20 to one, the same thing. So 50 to one, you have a, a narrow field of view. So if you're trying to get a, a small spot, but the, the thing to remember is that the, the infrared gun is, is averaging that whole spot size. So when this thing is looking, this is the eight to one um, diagram. So if you're at 16 inches and you have a two inch spot, it's giving you the average of that whole two inch field of view. So that, that's important to understand both from application and from calibration. You, you have to have the gun, this, the target, this has to fall completely on the target that you're focusing on when you do. That's one of the causes of variability. So when you're using an infrared gun, let's look at some of the, the things that can affect the infrared measurement. Um, again, the absorption of different infrared wavelengths by the atmosphere. So you know, even though you pick eight to 14 microns to be less sensitive to humidity, you still are, and you'll get a variation from low humidity to high humidity. Again, that's why when you're in a lab setting, we control the humidity to be consistent. One of the reasons humidity affects a lot of things. Glass windows. Again, as you said, IR, um, it may look, it may pass visible light, but it doesn't pass IR. So if you, if you actually make a measurement through a glass window, what you're going to find out is how warm the glass is. 
not, uh, not how warm the thing behind the glass. Um, again, you could use, you, you can use like silicon germanium windows onto a process. They attenuate the IR by some amount, but you can calibrate through the window, but at least you can do that if that becomes an issue. Again, the wavelength sensitivity, the IR sensor, that, uh, that's going to vary. The target emissivity, we've, we've looked at that, of course. What is the emissivity of the, the area you're doing? Coatings, films, oxidization of the target. This is an interesting problem. Like if you're looking at steel coming out of some process, uh, it might, you know, you might say, well, the emissivity of steel is this, but what your infrared sensor is seeing is the scale on the surface of the pipe, and that has a completely different emissivity than the steel you're actually looking at. So uh, it's something to be aware of. Here's a great problem. So now you're measuring temperature, but what you find out is that the, a, a, a substance emissivity changes with temperature. So not only now do you have to say, what, what substance have I set my gun for that substance, then you also say, what, about what temperature am I expecting from that substance to get the emissivity set correctly. We, we discussed field of view, but again, where you're, where you're measuring is it fully within the view of the field of view of the sensor? The distance to the target, the farther the, the, farther the, the thing you're measuring gets away, the more other influences start to get in. So when you're, when you're looking at something that's long range, you, know, the, the, you start getting leakage from the walls, the lights, other infrared emitting sources start to leak into this. So long distances start to become problematic. A little known effect is, is the ambient temperature change. So inside of an infrared gun is a thermopile. So you're focusing this infrared energy on the thermopile. That thermopile is, is really a series of thermocouples. That's what it is. So it operates really a lot, a lot like a thermocouple. And to do that, you need to compensate the, the uh, you need to compensate that thermopile for the cold junction um, effects of, of the measurement. So you actually have a, a CJC measurement going on inside the infrared gun. And what that means is if you walk outside on a cold day, the gun has to acclimate to that temperature before it actually can make a good reading. And sometimes this can take a half an hour if you're not aware of it. So if you're gonna, if you're gonna be using a temperature, a, a therm, an IR gun in different ambient temperatures, it's better to leave the gun in the ambient temperature where it's going to be used. So you can use that in a hot factory, leave it out there so that when someone picks it up to use it, you know, don't take it in and out of an air conditioned area to, you know, it's, it's 75 degrees here and then it's 100 degrees out in the plant. Or if it's, uh, or if you're using it in a freezer, it's, IR guns aren't great in really cold temperatures, but uh, again, if you're going to use it in an application like that, leave it in that, in that environment instead of changing its environment. That also helps improve the accuracy. And we've talked about stray infrared radiation getting in there. And of course, again, you, know, you have to consider the fact that uh, is there a lot of carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, oxygen, or water vapor, what's in there that could be affecting my reading. So let's have a little bit of, of fun now with infrared guns and, and surface measurements. You mentioned, uh, you mentioned the surface measurement here. Um, I'm going to take this surface probe. I'm going to throw it on here. Yeah, probably so. So let me just, you know, we could, uh, my phone, I want to hook my phone up to the, to this guy so we can see what's going on. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it sees my face. That's probably. Oh, okay. Let's see if we have that. Yeah, we're. I think we're live. So I'm gonna first just say, well, what is the. What is the temperature of this? And. Uh, hmm. It'll it'll find it. So um, I'm sitting here on this surface probe. 
you can do a couple of things here. You know, it's like, how consistent is this? You can see it's still climbing. You can see the direction indicator. It's, it's still going up a little bit. And this is, uh, this is not a lab grade hot plate. This is, uh, you know, <laughs> it's gonna heat and cool, but it looks like it's stabilizing about 170. Okay, so we're somewhere in that range. Now, I'm gonna take this gun, I don't, I don't have a link for this gun, but if I, if I shoot this table right here, it's telling me 20 degrees C, 20.8, that's, that's probably about right. So it seems to get ambient pretty well. Um, let's shoot the, let's see, this is a uh, um, eight to one, excuse me, 12 to one. Um, so at, at, you know, I should have about an inch spot, which is about right at about 12 inches. So I should be seeing this thing. So, um, okay. Well, that's just 244 degrees. This one does not let me set emissivity, but this is a, a flat metal surface, flat, uh, flat black. It's, it's not gonna be perfect, but the emissivity is gonna be between 0 0.9 and one, pretty safe to say. So I shouldn't be off by 100 degrees almost. <laughs> um, so let's, let's check a couple other things. What else can we do with an IR gun? And I'm not really trying to beat up on these because I, I don't make IR guns. Um, I compete with them, but they're really useful in a lot of applications. But let's look at the, let's look at the, the, the lid of the pot. Oh, that says 35C. Let's see what the surface probe says. The water inside the pot's boiling, so I know the water's probably about 100 degrees, but. Okay, so 80 C. So it, it, you know, this is, says 38 C. Well, that's like body temperature, right? So you would think, oh, I could touch that lid. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> Let's try something else out. You know, this is a, uh, need some more, I'm gonna put some more water in that thing. So this is a flat, I, I brought this one because this is just a nice flat back cast iron. This is like really good cast iron. This is great. You can, you can do this without too much trouble. Um, so, you know, just the difference. So this is telling me 220 now, where, you know, when I was shooting this thing, it's saying 284. So the difference is, these are, this is gonna be a little bit cooler. Um, so anyway. That's C or F? Hmm? Let's, let's see. Yeah, it's hot. Okay. <laughs> I've been sitting here, <laughs> been cooking all morning. Any answer is I don't, I don't think it's 220C anyway. I think, you know, this is showing about 160. That's, and that, that's about what I would expect out of a 1500-watt hot plate. It is. So, so you can see the difference between this surface directly on the hot plate. This thing's been sitting here so long; it's pretty normal. It's a little bit different, but it's not. It's not as much difference as this. I, I also was playing around just as an interesting effect. If I put a little oil in this pan, I didn't bring any oil, but you put some oil in the pan, the difference in temperature between the oil, because now it's changed the emissivity of the surface, and the non-oily surface is, is very significant. Um, just as another point as well, he was, Richard was making the point about probes. This is gonna be, um, this is gonna be T1. So this is an immersion probe. And I was like, how does that work in a, on a surface? And it's like, it's gonna get warm, but it's gonna take bloody forever because, and, and it's not gonna ever come to the right temperature because what you'll end up with is a gradient. You know, this, this handle will be room temperature and that's gonna be hot. And, uh, you know, it's, it's somewhere in between. Still getting warm, but, you know, what's it gonna to top out at? And, you know, how are I press it? So again, point there is, you know, you want the, you want the right probe for the right application. 
you'll never get the you'll never get the right with the immersion probe. You'll never get the right answer on a surface. Let me throw this back on here. For this is for the. Yeah. I'm going to estimate something else here shortly. Okay. So real quick, uh, I wanted to summarize some of the differences between contact and non-contact, just when, when you're influencing the choices that people make. You know, contact thermometers measure temperature using the heat transfer phenomenon known as conduction. So they're, they, they rely on the probe coming to the same temperature of the medium you're measuring. And, uh, you know, as you pointed out in the, in the blood case, it's not actually made, measuring the critical point that, that, that might be important to your, um, to your, your process. So it really does have to bring the temperature of that to the, uh, to the object that you're measuring. And so that's where lower mass helps. The lighter the mass can be, uh, the, uh, the, the better off you can make this measurement. There's a, we have a probe up here that, uh, it's a, it's a hypodermic probe, so at the end it has a very small tip, and that's where the sensor is. So that can sp very quickly come up to temperature, um, as opposed to something like this immersion probe, which is it's like it got quite a bit of mass on it. And of course, the non-contact thermometer uses an internal sensor to measure the level of infrared emission. So it's it uh, there could be a number of we covered most of the issues there but and we talked about the sources of air for the non-contact for the infrared but wanted to point out some of the sources of air for contact measurement for you know consistency so a poor physical contact I showed that immersion probe sitting on the the uh, the cast iron pan it, it's never going to couple it's got a rounded tip so you've got really just a point contact where you're trying to conduct all that heat through it's not going to work. It's why a dry well has a has a you know you, you pick the the size of the the cavity that matches closely to the probe, so you're coupling all around it. Um, and and again, as Richard said, you want to be able to immerse something at least four times the diameter of the the sensor that you're you're putting in there. Um, so, and that's also again to keep in mind with uh, an RTD those long elements. Uh, you have to immerse that whole thing significantly inside of in, into whatever you're measuring. And as you're doing that, of course, you know, you've got a probe there. The, the heat's trying to conduct its way up out of, the, uh, out of the, the probe itself. So if you're measuring something pretty small, you can actually uh, affect the, the temperature of what you're measuring. Because if you think about this, if uh, maybe you're measuring a, something on a circuit board, you put a, uh, a probe on it, now you've created a heat sink. It's starting to cool off the thing you're trying to measure. Um, and here's the, again, for immersion, you need to immerse it deep enough. And of course, if you, uh, if you send something too deep, um, then you start measuring like the bottom of the pan. I, I, we, uh, we built some probes for somebody who was cooking chicken and they were cooking in these big industrial ovens. And they had a uh, you know a process where somebody came in and measured the uh, the chicken, and they'd stick a, a spear probe through it and measure it. And while they were they weren't cooking the chicken properly, the person was stabbing the spear all the way through and measuring the temperature of the pan underneath the chicken. You know, so <laughs> so we put a we built a probe with a flange on it, so it went in a certain depth, and you know, it's, it's all kinds of stuff. There there are more ways to to uh, fool yourself. So let's talk a little bit about IR calibration and how that gets done. And this is where we'll get some of this stuff. There's some, I, I put a link here too on the, the IR um, work that's being done. And this is a 2017 paper that was put out by B, BIPM in France. It's written in English so you can, you can, you can read it. Um, understanding it gets a little bit more difficult. So a classic way 
Uh, you've probably seen this. If you do use IR guns, here's, a, you know, here's your black body target. You set this to a temperature. Theoretically, your spot size fits on this, this plate. Um, and that is, that your, becomes your reference. Uh, these, you know, these have a, basically a heater in them. And so you've got this, this is your IR thermometer you're calibrating. This is the reference surface here. Inside this will be a probe that measures the temperature of that surface. You're making an assumption about emissivity. So there'll be a statement, right, that says, well, the surface is 0.98. So, you know, you say, okay, that's the emissivity of the surface. You, you take that, you, 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 you're, you're making that assumption based on the manufacturer's rec, um, statement. If, you know, somebody has spilled, uh, you know, some silicon oil on this thing and changed the surface, the, the, all bets are off there. The surface has to be clean and devoid of contaminants. So you're using now, so you have a contact probe on here. In here is a controller that's reading that contact. So you've got an instrument that's part of that. And then that all, ultimately, that's going back through an ITS-90 table to, for that. So that's one way of tracing this all the way back. However, the, there is um, the, the radiation thermometry path. So now you have an IR thermometer, and um, you have a reference surface. And that actually is, an, instead of measuring this with a contact thermometer, you can actually measure this surface with a traceable IR thermometer. And that's a special piece uh, in itself. And that goes through this ITS-90 black body process that's, that's uh, referenced in this paper. So to, to generate some of, the, to create some of these things, what they're relying on is, is some of those, uh, as we talked in calibration, some of those triple point cells with a, a reference surface. And they're, and they're actually summing the, the radiation coming off that surface and coming up with a statement about how much radiation is coming off of that. You can look at this wide spectrum and say, okay, I can exclude the visible light, the interferences, and, and try to come up with some mathematical representation of how much infrared radiation is coming off this surface. And, um, and again, it's back to, if you, this chain here, if you do this well, you can actually end up with something that's a 1% accurate. And then you take it out and you give it to an operator and they use it in some way that's completely different and another, you know, the, so it's, it's back to measure it with a micrometer, cut it with an ax kind of problem. But there are a lot of applications where people are using these guns. Again, it's the fastest growing section because they're just so, so useful. So many. Things.